Joining me now is Max Blumenthal. Uh, he is the author of a new book, The Management of Savagery, How America's National Security State Fueled the Rise of Al Qaeda, ISIS, and Donald Trump. Uh, it's an interesting combination. Max has written for the New York Times, LA Times, Daily Beast, The Nation. He also has his own independent journalism outlet named The Gray Zone Project. Uh, Max, welcome to the Young Turks. Good to see you, Jenk. Good to see you. All right, so a lot to get to. Let's start with uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, let me start simple uh, or maybe complicated. Did we start them? Well, absolutely. We I wouldn't say the U.S. explicitly founded them, but the main theme of this book is how the um, U.S. national security state, which is this kind of opaque, unelected entity, uh, we could best identify with the FBI and CIA, uh, cr helped fuel. The monster of international jihadism to achieve geopolitical goals from um, collapsing the Soviet Union to um, collapsing states like Libya and Syria, and in turn uh, wound up creating refugee flows and this monster of international jihadism that fueled the Islamophobia and right wing xenophobia that helped uh, propel Donald Trump's successful presidential campaign. And I think, you know, when people look back at Trump's victory, they look at many reasons why he won, um, and we rarely talk about the role of Islamophobia and xenophobia. And that's something that I think was constructed over the past two decades, in part because of the blowback we've received from the proxy war in places like Afghanistan, where the CIA dumped over $1 billion into the Afghan Mujahideen and helped bring figures like Osama bin Laden uh, to the Afghan border to support their goal, which was then collapsing the Soviet Union. So this book is really a history of all of the disastrous interventions and how it's led us to the kind of political catastrophe we're facing in the West. So I want to talk about the purpose of that in a second, but let me just um, give you a little sense of, of where I come at this. Um, yeah. So I used to be a much more interventionist. Um, in fact, I was very interventionist and then a little interventionist. And now I'm all the way on the side of uh, against intervention. Why? Facts. Facts happened. Uh, so, yeah, we helped the Mujahideen fight against Russia, and that created uh, Bin Laden and Al Qaeda. It did. It did. That's a fact. Uh, and so, it doesn't mean we wanted Al Qaeda to rise, but it does mean that we did partly cause it, very largely help cause it. Uh, and then uh, we uh, intervened in Iraq. Now I thought that was a terrible idea, and we were right about that. And did ISIS rise out of the ashes of Iraq? Definitely, definitely. There's no question about that. So intervention after intervention has been an absolute disaster. But that's a disaster for the American people, but maybe not a disaster for others. So that leads to my question, Max. What's your sense here? Are, are we serial bunglers, and we just keep intervening? And then, oops, we did it again, and then we've got another problem, and then we got to intervene again, and we just never learned the lesson. Or do you think that there are some people within the United States government who know that and are happy to do this because more war creates more economic opportunity for certain people? But that is a great question. And actually, I wouldn't be so hard on yourself. I remember co-hosting one of your first shows back in the day in LA, and you were strongly against the war in Iraq at a time when most Americans were for it. Um, and I think that comes from an understanding of how destabilizing countries in the Middle East can lead to the rise of groups like ISIS. But what the US proceeded to do um, through figures like John Brennan, former CIA director, who's now seen as kind of a hero of the anti-Trump resistance, was to dump weapons into the Free Syrian Army, uh, which was kind of a repackaging of the Afghan Mujahideen. Uh, and this proceeded to become a weapons farm for Al Qaeda and later ISIS to take over entire cities and neighborhoods and regions in Syria and allow ISIS to spread. What happens from there? Well, you have a refugee crisis. You have the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Uh, you also have a refugee crisis from Libya, where the US supported groups like the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which was uh, an affiliate of Al Qaeda. And John McCain actually flew to Libya to meet with its leader. And so you have refugee outflows from Libya and Syria, uh, driving far right politics in Europe. But this achieves a goal for the neoconservatives, 
uh, who wanted to see these countries, which refused to have U.S. military bases inside their borders, which resisted Israel, um, and which generally acted independently from the U.S. sphere of influence, they wanted to see them weakened and destabilized. And so Syria is far weaker than it has been. Uh, It's part of the anti-Iran campaign that's been waged since 1979. And Libya is still in a state of civil war. And I think there are people in the U.S. national security state, people like John Brennan, who want to see these countries perpetually destabilized, even as these refugee outflows drive the rise of figures like Donald Trump and many Trumps across Europe. So Max, look, there are some people who benefit from the destabilization of the Middle East. Yeah. Um, maniacally, uh, the Israeli right wing thinks destabilizing the Middle East is a good idea for Israel. I'm pretty sure it's not, uh, but that is their stance. Uh, and so they think that they benefit from it. Uh, More importantly, uh, the uh, defense contractors make a lot of money from perpetual war, and that's exactly what we're in. And the the oil companies make a lot more money if there's uh, instability in the Middle East, which drives up oil prices without affecting their costs at all. And so oftentimes, so I get that. But for the people inside the American government, do you think that they're actually thinking about that? Or do they tell themselves pretty little lies and they think, well, no, I care about geopolitical interests. And in the back of their minds, they're thinking, well, one day I might work for a defense contractor. Like, what's your sense of the, of the process there? I mean, you have the neoconservatives, um, the Douglas Fights and the Richard Pearls who are thinking about Israel first. Then you have people like Jim Mattis who just come out straight out of uh, you know, the military uh, or people like Mike Pompeo who represent the military and the corporate state of the Koch brothers, they're thinking about, you know, how the military can benefit, how this can drive defense budgets. Um, And then you have the liberal humanitarian interventionists, the people who are around Hillary Clinton. And I write about them a lot in my book, The Management of Savagery, because these are the people who conceived uh, the catastrophic uh, destruction of Libya. And Samantha Power believes that we have to save the people uh, from the evil dictator by essentially bombing them. This is why we saw influence operations like the Syrian white helmets constructed, uh, not out of Syria, but actually out of Turkey by a British military intelligence officer. It's to convince us that by invading and bombing these countries, we're saving the children. And the result that we get every time is a humanitarian catastrophe, like we're seeing in Libya, where even CNN has reported that there are open air slave auctions. Um, The weakest and most vulnerable in these societies, religious minorities, Christians, Alawites, um, gay people, they and women suffer have suffered the most from our interventions. And of course, many of them wind up becoming refugees and driving this far right uh, politics across the West. So the liberal interventionist uh, philosophy, the response that we have a responsibility to protect civilians with our military was totally discredited in Libya. And I think the point of this book is to warn people that we should never do this again and that we should not allow these figures, the Susan Rices and Samantha Powers, the Hillary Clintons, back into government. Yeah. So Libya is actually what I'm uh, being hard on myself for. I think that's the, the uh, thing that I was uh, wrong about. And so, look, you know, back when I was a Republican, I was for the Persian Gulf War. I even did a pro war rally, but I'm way past those days, obviously. It's a different person. Uh, I was 100% right about Iraq, where this is one of the only two national shows who were saying, don't go in. It's a terrible idea under under every circumstance. But on Libya, I I was a a liberal interventionist. And and look, Max, I I don't think intervention is wrong in every scenario. I, I think you would agree with that. World War II, in a sense, we intervene. Uh, I would argue the Korean War at least saved South Korea, and that was the facts in my mind that I was going under. And but now every single intervention has been an absolute disaster, including Libya. But that leads me to my question. So, okay, we've learned that going and dropping bombs, even if you don't have ground troops in a place like Libya, causes chaos. So, what's the alternative? Should we have let Gaddafi stay in power? Or should we have let that slow motion civil war just go on by itself? What's the answer? Yeah, another good question, and it's it's kind of a false choice. Um, I point to uh, the British parliamentary inquiry on Libya, as well as a report at the Harvard Belfer Center, um, which was sort of an autopsy on the Libyan intervention because it was deemed such a catastrophic failure that showed that 
Qaddafi had already retaken every city um, at a cost of less than 1,000 lives. This was not the humanitarian catastrophe we thought it was. And this lie about him marching on Benghazi to slaughter everything was everyone was just that. It was a complete lie. Uh, the U.S. has had no place there, and we have to recognize that there wasn't some. There may have been protests for reform, but he was facing a militarized campaign by hardcore Islamist elements that were being armed by Qatar and the United States, and that if that arms flow had been cut off, the proxy war or the war that was going on in Libya would have never taken place. So, you know, if the U.S. would just get out and stop coordinating with Gulf monarchies that are far more reactionary than the dictators that we oppose, many more lives would be spared, many people would not be refugees or have drowned in the Mediterranean, and many less right-wing parties across Europe would not have been elected. Um, that's the lesson of this book. Of course, we should take in the refugees. We should welcome them. We should also welcome the people who are coming from Central America from governments like Honduras, which were destabilized under the watch of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. But we shouldn't repeat these mistakes. And so I'd point to Venezuela as a country where we're actively trying to destabilize it through sanctions, as well as Iran. We're using sanctions as a weapon of war in place of conventional war. We should learn from these mistakes because if Venezuela experiences regime change, they're going to face an internal catastrophe that will be extremely violent. And the caravan that we saw on the border, I mean, Trump's going to have to build the highest wall in history uh, to hold back the migration flow that'll come from the catastrophe of Venezuela if the U.S. achieves its goal. Yeah. So we should prize stability and respect the people in these countries first. So Max, I only have time for one more question because I could talk yeah. to you a long time and I would love to get into Venezuela, but we're gonna have to save that for another time. So look, I, I, on the other hand, sanctions do also sometimes work. They worked in South Africa. So that's why I think it's a, it's a little bit more uh, complicated and, and a harder uh, puzzle to solve. I'm not saying we should invade any place where there's a dictator. We'd be invading half the, uh, the world and I don't wanna invade North Korea, inv invading uh, Iraq, uh, even though they had a terrible dictator in Saddam Hussein, was still a terrible idea. But does that mean that you know we just let uh, Gaddafi stay in Libya for as long as he's going to stay in Saddam and Assad, etc.? Like, is there nothing that could be done if we can't do sanctions? And I obviously don't want to do military intervention. Is there an answer or no? Libya pre previously was one of the most pro prosperous countries in Africa. Certainly not democratic, but Neither is Uganda, uh, our ally. It had free schooling, it had free health care, it was stable, it had a minority population. And what we've seen since was not just the complete destabilization of the country and the erosion of its economy, um, but uh, the slaughter of many members of its Tawarga black population. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we should have done nothing. But we have to recognize this is never about human rights. Venezuela is not about human rights. Syria, despite what the white helmet said, was not about human rights. It's about opening up opportunities for American capital, for oil companies. It's about increasing defense budgets. And companies like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, uh, they have made a healthy profit while the people of these countries who did not want their governments decapitated and who want to be able to resolve their own problems internally, as we do, we Americans don't want to be interfered with by outside powers, obviously. Uh, they should be respected. And so if you want to talk about meddling, I know you know um, we debate this all the time about Russian meddling or Chinese meddling. I mean, if you want to talk about meddling, let's consider what the U.S. is doing in Venezuela and has done throughout the Middle East uh, since the Cold War. That meddling uh, makes anything Russia has done to us seem elegant. <laughs> elegant. Okay, <laughs> uh, we really got to go, but I, I, do, I want to say a couple of things in favor of Max real quick. Uh, look, in Libya, even uh, as I supported the bombing in the beginning, as I saw that every country that was in favor of the bombing did not have oil contracts in Libya. And every country that opposed the bombing did have uh, oil contracts in Libya. It gave me pause, facts matter, right? And then we have dictators all across the world that we absolutely support, like Saudi Arabia. <laughs> the worst dictators arguably on the planet and we're hunky dory with them. We're not talking about human rights there. but. All of a sudden, two countries that have nothing to do with one another, Iran and Venezuela, they only have one thing in common. All of a sudden, we're really concerned about their human rights. 
and what, what a lucky break it did. Turns out they both have a ton of oil under the ground. And, and exactly. at, least, at least John Bolton did us a favor by going on Fox News and clearly stating that yes, they're doing it for the American oil companies. He just flat out said it. And, and Max also broke the story three weeks before the New York Times did that the trucks that were lit on fire in Venezuela were not by Maduro's military, by, by, by anti-Maduro protesters. And that was later verified by other media outlets. So Max, thank you for joining us, we appreciate it. I really appreciate it, Cenk. Like what you see, click the subscribe button below and don't forget to ring the bell to never miss another video from the Young Turks.